Uh, can everyone hear me okay? It's Martin speaking, but it'll show as Natalie. Just give me a thumbs up if you can. Good. Okay, right. So it's three o'clock. Should we start? Um, I think people will join us as we go along. So uh, thanks everyone for coming in. The, the plan is that I'm going to talk and then uh, Martin's going to talk. So basically, if your name's Martin, you're allowed to talk in this session. Um, so I'm going to talk about my book, Battle for Open, and then uh, Martin's going to talk about uh, Open Access and Humanity. So both these books came out recently and it seemed like they were in a similar area, so why not do a, a joint a joint launch? So that's what we're doing. Um, so hopefully talk for about 20 minutes with uh, 10 minutes for questions, and then Martin do the same. Um, so let me know if I crash out or put something in the text chat. Otherwise, I'll just uh, just plow on. Uh, right, okay. So I've written this book called The Battle for Open, as, as some of you may well know. Uh, so it came out uh, last week kind of officially in digital format with uh, Ubiquity Press uh, and apparently just shipped the hard copies to me so the hard copies should be available soon too if that's your thing. So the kind of uh, central argument in the book is that uh, openness has been victorious. It's kind of hey, it's a time for celebration and that is indeed the, uh, the Chuckle Brothers. Um, so it felt like, you know, we've kind of been working in open education for a long time, open access, uh, open educational resources, open scholarship, all, so all these things. And over the past couple of years, it's felt that they kind of pushed through into more mainstream approaches. Um, and that's part, partly what I wanted to explore in this book. So why has that approach been victorious? But also, I think perhaps more, more interestingly is, um, although they've kind of stopped being a peripheral interest and, and now kind of moved into the mainstream, it's now that it's the, the kind of is when the real battle begins. Like, how is openness going to be developed over the, the sort of next five or so years? And that, that's the kind of real central argument I want to kind of explore in the book. So, uh, in this talk, I want to talk a bit about a kind of a meta bit, if you like, uh, talk about the book itself, why I wrote it, and why why this approach. Um, then I'm going to just briefly discuss why I talk about it in terms of a battle. Um, I'm going to look at just two areas of open education uh, to kind of illustrate my argument um, and look at features kind of how, open, how openness is won and what those kind of tensions, what, that, around that, what those kind of battle areas are now for those. Um, if you get time, I want to briefly just touch upon the, the, the battle for narrative. So I think it's kind of a really interesting topic for us who work in this area and then some conclusions. So that's, that's my plan. So uh, why write a book at all? Um, strange enough, this may be breaking news, but books are actually quite good. They're a good way to explore um, an idea in some sort of length and depth. Um, who knew? So um, I've, I've kind of been writing blog posts about this for quite some time. I didn't realise I was, I was working up towards a book. And it's the same process that really happened with uh, my last book, uh, The Digital Scholar. It kind of, if you're a blogger, you find you kind of keep coming back to things, and other people are also blogging in similar areas, and you're kind of having these discussions. So a lot of it was kind of I was finding I was writing a lot about kind of things like the, the Finch report about open access um, in the UK or uh, MOOCs and those kind of things. Particularly, we're having lots, I was having lots of discussions with people you know, about you know, is, is this really open, or, or what it meant to use different licenses, or what it meant for a MOOC to call itself open, those kind of things. It felt like there was stuff kind of circling around here. And actually, when I sat down and started to think about it, there was a, an argument I wanted to explore that I think was worthwhile, and, and the book was a, a good format to do that. So uh, why did I go with uh, Ubiquity Press? Um, so the, the model with Ubiquity is um, the, it's gold root open access, if you like. So uh, we paid a fee up front, and for that, they undertake a number of services. You're really kind of paying for published services. Um, so uh, they did the copy editing and layout, and um, they'll put it into, and they've released, they produced a Kindle version, and an EPUB version, a PDF, and so on. And um, then it'll be printed, and you can buy the print copy if you want. Um, and I think that actually the, the story of why to go with Ubiquity is itself an interesting example of, of my argument in a way. 
I think you can have an argument that says like all gold root is bad, but I think really it's a question of degree. So, um, so I think we paid somewhere between three and four thousand pounds for the pictures to do this for us, which is a lot of money if you're an individual. But for a research project, it's about the same sort of price as going to a fancy overseas conference, and you could argue it's a better use of that kind of dissemination money. Um, and I've heard people approach. Uh, the kind of big publishers, academic publishers, and ask to do their book open access, and publishers tell us, yeah, that would be twenty thousand pounds, which kind of isn't really taking a risk at all. It's just basically you're paying for all the profit you would have made anyway. And and you basically have a nice model where, so once you pay that fee, that, that's it then, and you get to keep any kind of uh, profits on the on the sale of the hardback. But also you can split those profits, so um, some of that money then goes into a fund for um, authors who need a fee waiver, so for authors coming from developing countries or early career researchers who couldn't afford to pay that fund, then um, they can ask for a fee waiver from victory. So it seems like a really uh, nice model to explore. Um, it's interesting writing a book like this. Um, so I've kind of been blogging it for a while without realising this is what I was doing, and when I kind of decided I wanted to write a book, I then went back to my blog and sort of trawled through it and sort of pulled together all the, the different posts that might relate to the, the, the book structure, the chapters. And I ended up with about sort of 30,000 words, and, and the book's only sort of 60,000 words long, so kind of nearly halfway there before it even started. Um, now, all, all that kind of needed rewriting, there's, a, there's quite an interesting difference between the, the tone of writing you have for a blog and the... Um, the tone of writing you need in a book. Um, but so they need to rewrite, but at least you can not start from scratch, and that, that, that's really useful, I think. And also, that there's this, and that, but also then as I was writing stuff, I'd release parts of it through my blog that kind of formed a coherent chunk, and people would give me feedback, they were kind, and that would kind of be form the writing itself. So it, it's interesting. And I was, um, I read a, a biography of Charles Dickens this year. And uh, I was reminded how he kind of used to publish all these books in serial format. So we're kind of returning to the serial publication format, I think. And it's good enough for Charles Dickens, and it's good enough for me. Uh, so why write this book? <coughs> I felt, you know, as I mentioned, we've kind of been going around these, a lot of the themes in this book, this idea of, firstly, the kind of success of openness as an approach, and it's pushed from being a periphery, a periphery interest into kind of mainstream interest. Uh, and also the, the kind of tensions around openness. So uh, I know David Kernan's in the room, so you know the stuff that we've been talking about a lot online, and people like Walter Wolf has been writing about, and uh, David Wise talking about as well. So there was kind of felt like a, a theme to be explored there, and, and now was the time to do it. It felt like you know, this was a, a particular moment in the in, in the development of open education that was worth exploring. So that's my. Uh, my kind of meta bit about of, of writing the book itself. Um, so why call it a battle? I know some people don't like uh, that kind of military language, but I think it, there are three things that are kind of connected with with warfare and a battle. But I think they're kind of quite relevant here and sort of add to it. First of all, I think there are kind of real areas of conflict. People believe very different things in this area about what constitutes being open. You know, some people are very hard line about it. For other people, it's just a label and open equals free. Uh, so they've got different interpretations of what it means to be open. And people have very kind of ca passionate beliefs about them. So like like all battles, you know, the things that people are really fighting about that that, they, that, that that matter to them. But also like most real wars or battles, there's actually money underneath all this. And you know, the global education market is worth you know, pick, pick a figure out the last one I had quoted me was eight trillion dollars before that was six trillion dollars, but you know, basically people don't know. So uh, higher education is a massive market, and lots of people want to get into it. Uh, and openness is often seen as uh, open education is often seen as a route to market, I think, for lots of companies. But and also, open access publishing or education publishing is a big market. So, um, Elsevier's profits were something like two billion dollars last year. Turnover was two billion dollars. So, you know, th there's big money here um, at stake, and so people want to kind of control the direction of the money. So, it's not just Kind of of interest, not just an academic interest. There's kind of real real money at stake here, and that always makes people discuss stuff. Um, and lastly, I think the one that, that interests me most is you know, the, the phrase that the victor writes history. So I think there's a kind of a battle for narrative here, 
And you saw that particularly with MOOCs, and if we have time, I'll, I'll try and touch upon that. Um, but who tells the story about openness and what it means? So that those three things, I think, are kind of all relevant for, for battles. I think they're all relevant for uh, the direction of openness at the moment. So that's why I kind of felt justified to call it a, a battle for openness. So in the book, um, I've just given some kind of background and looking at some of the, the history of modern open education, I explore four uh, areas which are open access, OERs, MOOCs and open scholarship. Um, and today I'm just going to briefly touch upon two of them which are uh, open access and MOOCs just to kind of illustrate the, the points really. So uh, open access is commonly defined as free online access to scholarly works. And this is kind of probably the most mature area um, of, of openness really and it's one of the kind of big areas of success. So in, in lots of countries now we've got big mandates to say any publicly funded work needs to be published in open access and uh, Martin will talk in much more detail about it. So there's commonly sort of quoted the two routes to open access. Gold, where it's not quite off the pays. Um, so there is a fee usually paid to uh, publishers to make to release stuff under an open access license. And where, the, and where that money comes from is usually through a research project. Um, but it kind of it keeps the, the current status quo. Really. So you're thinking of using journals as the distribution mechanism. Really. And the green route is, is self-archiving or through um, institutional repositories. Those kind of things. <coughs> so we've got uh, major policies in most countries now. So uh, the US, Britain, uh, Europe, Australia, so Canada is mandating that any research that's funded through government agencies, uh, then the publications that come out of that need to be uh, released open access. That's, that's kind of been a real major success, really, in the kind of adoption of open access. So it's moved from being the sort of thing that you know, a few people used to bang on about and say, you, you must release this stuff, and you go, yeah, yeah, but I need to publish in these proper journals. It's kind of major publishers and ma major journals now releasing stuff under open access license. Which is great. Uh, there was a survey done by the publishers Wiley recently. Um, for the first time ever, of, the, of their authors, they found that more than 50% of them had published at least one article under open access. That kind of gets to my, but the point of my argument about you know, it's moved from the periphery into the mainstream now. So it doesn't mean that everyone is publishing open access, all articles, but we've kind of reached a tipping point now where it's not, a, it's not an unusual thing to come across open access. Uh, and this article here demonstrates the, the rise of open access articles and the rise of open access journals. You know, and there's a, even for uh, a non-statistician, there's a pretty clear trend in that. You know, and I think there's no suggestion that's going to stop going that way. So what are the battles um, in that area? Uh, I think first of all, there are some issues around the, the gold route. Um, there are worries that you know, not everyone can afford to pay. Um, does it, does it come, ironically, does openness kind of lead to elitism? So are those people kind of with good research projects can afford to pay, um, end up getting published? Uh, there's also a kind of slightly more pernicious thing of, of the hybrid route. So publishers are still charging libraries subscription fees with the journals, uh, and at the same time, charging individual articles to be released under an open access license. So they're kind of getting the, the double dip, I mean, the EU has come down very strongly against the hybrid route, but uh, people like the Finch Report have suggested that it's a, it's a transition phase to allow uh, publishers to move over to, um, to open access, but often transition phases tend to stick around longer than we like, so it seems that the hybrid route is kind of worse for both worlds in terms of funding. And there's also predatory open access practice, so um, I'm sure a lot of you have had experience with this. You kind of get these emails, please publish in a journal. And you go and look at the publisher and they kind of have a list of 20,000 different journals they publish. So it's clearly just, just pay to publish, basically. There's very little quality control. Um, and so that kind of undermines the whole practice of academic publishing. I think it's a very interesting thing about uh, if, if the author is paying to publish, um, that changes the nature of that relationship um, in, a, in, a, in a slightly different way. So if you're getting money through libraries, you could, the, the, there's no pressure on the publisher or the editor of a journal to kind of accept uh, an article necessarily, that they'll probably have enough. Um, 
so I, I, I run, I'm editor of journal, uh, Giant, and if we were getting paid, you know, three thousand pounds per article, I couldn't honestly say we don't we, we free to publish. You, you couldn't have to say if you, if you had one more article to come in, you thought, well, actually, I'll get another three thousand pounds of that. That wouldn't influence your decision. And so there's a very good book by uh, Michael Sandel called What Money Can't Buy, and he talks about the, the way um, the market changes the, the relationship with lots of things. And I think that's, this is an example of that which we can explore, which I think we're interested to start at. So David's gone, so he's missed me using his image. So I'll quickly talk about MOOCs. I think they're a really good example of the uh, um, this tension. So MOOCs kind of came from nowhere, and that was really interesting to watch kind of the past couple of years. I, I felt quite privileged to kind of almost witness this big explosion. So the blue line here using Google Trends, which is kind of normalizing stuff. Blue line is OER. So OER is kind of trying along, you know, getting decent notices. And then from nowhere, the red line, bam, MOOCs come from nowhere and suddenly sort of get all the, the media attention. Uh, just a, an, as an aside, someone suggests you should always compare anything that you think is important on Google Trends with uh, Kim Kardashian because it just shows it doesn't uh, relate at all. So, so MOOCs don't register compared to, to that. So, so we shouldn't get too carried away that actually people care about MOOCs that much. Um, so the success is here. There's kind of major MOOC providers have sprung up, people kind of delivering uh, material very quickly, you know, so it's sort of highly innovative practice. You know, technology, platforms, this kind of stuff. Um, millions of enrollments, people sign up. I think this is kind of what we always wanted. You know, suddenly, loads of people are signing up to study stuff freely and openly. Great. You know. Major media coverage, and this is what we always wanted. We used to be trying to get open education mentioned, and suddenly it's on Newsnight, it's in the New York Times, all these things. Uh, so, George Siemens has a quote if education was grunts and MOOCs where it's Nirvana, the kind of breakthrough acts that kind of allowed them. But there's some very interesting factors around MOOCs, I think, that they kind of perhaps personify this, this tension more than anything else. Uh, first of all, they're not really open, so they're not often not openly licensed. Some are, <coughs> but not, not a lot of the commercial ones. Uh, so you can you can take a piece and then um, reuse it elsewhere. Uh, a lot of them rely on a kind of very centralised data and platform. So their kind of business model is based on you as a university giving over your content. To the provider and then having a centralised platform and data, which might remove a lot of that kind of innovation you'd want to happen around your own material. Um, I'm not really going to talk about pedagogy and models and MOOCs, but um, they you know, they can't have individual support. That's the whole point of them being free. You can't afford to pay people to support. So there's a real question about the you know, work at the Open University, um, and we know it, it takes real effort to kind of help new learners, nervous learners stay with particularly online uh, distance education. And so there's a real question about whether MOOCs help the sort of people you might want them to help. Uh, there's also a kind of feeling that um, they kind of hijacked what openness means. And they remind me of those, those monkeys if you've been to somewhere like Longley or Sky Park. You're, you're driving along your car and these cute little monkeys jump up on the bonnet. They're yeah, nice, aren't they? And that's what MOOCs like. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's good. And then they start Ripping your, your, your wing mirrors off and your area and all that kind of stuff, and suddenly it <laughs> doesn't feel quite so friendly. And that's what MOOCs are put like. They're great, right, it's just what we wanted, and then the kind of venture capitalists have come in and have started trying to take over what it means to be open. There's, there's a real kind of tension there. Um, and what I think has been interesting is this whole kind of Silicon Valley narrative. So the reason the media loved MOOCs was because they seem to be like a technology solution to. To education being broken to so people like Sebastian Feinberg. He works for Google. He must know everything, you know, and come along. It. And there's a real kind of underlying narrative about all this about the way technology will solve education's problems. So uh, I'm obliged to always use this uh, image. So there's a kind of irresistible thing there for a lot of the media to pick up on in the way that open education resources didn't have. So that it always, it always a lot of the articles start with. Education is broken. That's stated as fact, usually kind of incontrovertible. Um, then the other phrase I like to use, you know, that there's a disruption obsession, obsession, obsession you know, from Plato Christensen stuff. You know that education is ripe for disruption. So you've got to have this kind of wholesale change. And and what we always want is a technology solution. And MOOCs are seen as a technology solution, and it's these kind of outsiders coming from outside of education, and, and they're 
white horses coming in to save us all because we can't rely on people in education. So there's kind of really nice stories to tell there for uh, um, newspapers that kind of appeals to that narrative. But it doesn't make much sense. I think, what we're looking at. But that, that kind of goes back to the idea about there being a, a battle for narrative because actually this story was what they wanted to tell um, about the subject. So I think there's a kind of real um, thing here for us who people who care about open education that, that the MOOC example demonstrates that if you don't tell your story then someone else will come along and, and tell a different story for you and it might not be the story you want. So we need to get we need to learn how to be good at telling stories and have engaging stories to tell I think. Um, just going to briefly end on why I think openness matters for higher education in particular. Uh, first of all, it's kind of a good thing to do. Uh, just sharing your resources, which, you know, that's what universities were set up for. And there's a nice altruistic feel for it. Um, but even if you want to put aside all that kind of soft stuff, you know, it's quite an efficient way of working. So that's why, particularly from the open source world, sometimes it just it's better to share stuff. And you, you know, that was the whole argument behind learning objects, which kind of had their problems. But why aren't we sharing a lot more teaching resources that other people can improve upon? As a, an academic or an institution, it could give you an increased profile. It's a really good way to disseminate stuff. You know, you get far more hits on articles that are released um, open access. Uh, you get wider participation in projects. If you want people to come in, if you're open, allow them to come in. And the really fun stuff happens when you have unexpected outcomes. So people take your stuff and adapt it and use it in different ways that you haven't predicted. Um, and I think it also that openness is one of the areas that allow for innovation. So uh, anyone who's seen the sort of stuff that happens with a lot of these kind of open courses at like DS106 or phone asking, the very process of being open allows other people to come in and do different things. And it's a different type of space um, than, than we have kind of in a lot of our kind of formal work. Um, and also allows for easy collaboration. So so many of us have worked on projects where we kind of have, we want to work with another university or something or someone else and we kind of set up memorandums of understandings and actually if you're just open it really makes the stuff happen easier. Yet it's under a Creative Commons license, you take it and use it if you want and then come back to me and we'll, we'll work on it if we need to but we don't need to set up all these kind of structures to work around, it actually just works very easily. So really uh, in conclusion, uh, what the book is really trying to ask is this kind of central question and sort of really put on the spot is what happens now when openness kind of ceases to be a niche interest and moves to the centre. And I think that's, the, that's the, what we're witnessing now and the next sort of four to five years I think will be central in that. Um, and I think it's partly up to us to determine that direction. And it's not just then it happens, it's not just be passive. So uh, lastly some links. Uh, so the book's there, so uh, Bitly Battle for Open. Uh, you can see my blog there and that's a publisher and you should all come and look at our lovely where we are research hub for uh, lots of funds and research as well. I'll end there and that gives us time for some questions and then over to Martin. Can I ask a question? Um, I was going to ask um, if you could say a bit more about the different economic premises in different countries that underlie open research versus open teaching and the tension that that makes for the total open practice as opposed to uh, the niche areas that you, you spoke of. I'm not sure I caught the end of that. Can you? I'm not sure I quite get the. the to it the strikes me that we compete for teaching. That's how institutions in countries where there are fees make their money is through student recruitment. Um, we don't, however, compete in that same way on a commodity or service basis for uh, research. We use that as a brand promoter to then recruit students, um, and that strikes me as giving us different economic backgrounds for open research versus open teaching. I just wondered if you could say a bit more about how MOOC movements and open educational resources fit into that landscape. Uh, okay, I'm not sure, um, I'll take your point, it's a good point. Uh, but I think we do compete for research anyway, you know, research funding is highly competitive, so 
uh, you are competing to get that kind of money as well, and often it's um, it's about having a good profile and being able to demonstrate things like impact. So openness plays into that. But I, and I think for uh, learning, it, it's, it's it's interesting we're teaching stuff, and I think some of the stuff we started to look at with the OER Research Hub um, shows that we're we're still not entirely clear about what the impact of, of OER stuff is, which I think is is acceptable because you know, it's still quite new. I've actually been it ten years. So one of the findings that we had was that uh, first of all, quite a lot of people are using OERs to investigate a subject before they decide to study it because they're going to pay big fees. So they want something. Do I really want to study psychology? And the best way to find that is often to look at university resources for psychology. And also, once they are studying, they're using. Uh, OERs to supplement the studies. We may be studying at a particular university, but you know, looking at iTunes U uh, lectures from another university. So you can argue that there's quite a good case there for universities. Uh, and also, we found that um, the people we surveyed, surveyed I mean, they were OER users, but about 24% of them said that um, looking at OER made them more likely to want to take paid for study. So there's a kind of sustainable model there that. And giving stuff away brings people to you, and then hopefully once they're, they're with you, they're more likely to stay as well because um, they, they know that it's the course for them before they started. So there's kind of just a practical model there, and, and and the competition in an expanding higher education market is um, isn't that fierce really. I think that there's it's more case of whether or how it's funded that's the issue. But I think uh, open education allows you to get the students you want and to perhaps kind of compete in terms of come study with us. But it, we're talking about, if we're talking a six trillion dollar market, which is there's all those kind of things that you need to build a university a week in order to compete with demand and stuff. So it's not a it's not a shrinking market where we're kind of chasing lesser resources. Did you want to say something, Cameron? And can you say something? Have you got have you got mic facilities? I don't know if everyone's got them. I don't want to feel like you couldn't quibble. You're free to quibble, <laughs> Cameron. <laughs> you just click on the talk button. But, uh, anyway. Right, OK, that brings us on pretty neatly to half time then. So I'm going to hand over to you, Martin. Um, and I think you're going to try and do something. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, is my volume OK for everyone? Just give an OK in the talk, and if not, I'll bump it up. Good, thank you. OK, so I am not as au fait with um, the Blackboard uh, Java applet as Martin. So I'm going to paste you a link to a Prezi, I'm afraid. Um, if you want to follow along there, um, I'm going to ha have some slides. They're mostly visual complement to what I'm going to say, as opposed to being crucial to its uh, intellectual content. So you can either do that, or you can sit and chat on Twitter or in the box or whatever you like. But um, I'll give you a, a clue when I'm going to transition slides. So my book has a much more niche focus than Martin's, which um, I read uh, this morning, actually, Martin's book. And I was impressed by the breadth and um, the often comprehensive treatment that he managed to give in, in a limited space in each chapter. My book takes a different tack and over the course of 78,000 words unpacks the specific challenges for open access to research for the humanities disciplines. So I'm not talking about um, the STEM market or there's not a huge critique of Elsevier embedded in there. There's virtually nothing about MOOCs. Um, instead, what I'm thinking about is uh, why have specific resistances emerged in the humanities differences in the disciplines? How are the economic situations different? Um, are the reward structures different, for example, in the fact we produce monographs as units of accreditation rather than journal articles? And is that difference just one of scale? 
So again, like Martin, my book is available open access from Cambridge University Press in my case. Um, they gave out about 16 individual chapter PDFs. If you want the whole version, you should head over to Lincoln University's repository uh, where I put the full version up. And it's under a CC by SA license. So you're free to reuse that as long as your derivative works um, continue to make the work open to others. So that's my intro slide. So if you want to move across onto the second slide, um, just to recap some of what Martin said, when we talk about open access, we mean peer-reviewed research, so we're not talking about lowering quality controls, that are free to read and reuse online. So we're not talking about cat videos online, we're not talking about lower quality work, we're simply talking about uh, reconfiguring the economics in some way so that we can give work away freely. And that's only possible, of course, because of the digital environment. So two ways we can do this. Um, Roots-wise, you have the gold route, which, as Martin said, is about um, the publisher or source making the work open access. It's not about a specific business model. It just means the publisher says, here's the work. Now, they can cover that, um, the economics of that in a variety of ways that I'll talk about later. But one of the most uh, known and maligned forms is the article processing charge, where publishing becomes a service model. Uh, the author, their funder, or their institution pays the uh, publisher because they're doing the labor of dissemination. The other way we can do open access is the green routes, which is the institutional or subject repository routes, where um, upon acceptance or, or later, in some cases, depending on publisher's policy, the author is allowed to deposit a version of their work in a repository. Sometimes this isn't the final version. It can be the um, accepted manuscript or other, other versions in the pre-post-print schema. Um, sometimes there can be an embargo. But fundamentally, green is a good transition mechanism in some ways because it doesn't require us to reconfigure the economics of the journal market. And we have 20 years of evidence from high energy physics that green open access does not damage publishers' subscription business models. Now, that might change tomorrow if we suddenly had 100% green open access. Um, it might not be the same in all disciplines. But if you go on those kind of suppositions, you'll never have any evidence in the present to give it a go because no evidence will be sufficient. So on that basis, we see a large number of mandates emerging around the world, particularly for green open access, where funds for uh, author pay type models aren't available. As Martin was um, pointing out, though, in his talk, um, open access is about more than just freedom to read. We're also talking about freedom to reuse. And I'll talk about why this might be contentious in the humanities disciplines uh, shortly, but also what the benefits might be. But fundamentally, in this slide, which is my most jargon heavy, uh, there are two terms we can use to talk about levels of openness in terms of permission, gratis and libra. Gratis means free to read. So if I put a blog post up on a website and I don't put any statement about copyright on that, I retain full copyright and others would only be allowed to reuse that material in accordance with fair use or fair dealings provisions in their relevant jurisdiction. If, however, I put an open licensing statement, such as one of the Creative Commons licenses on that work, others can do more than that. And there are many reasons why that may be beneficial to the Academy, I'd like to suggest. OK, so that's my jargon slide done. Background to open access, what it is. Go on to the next slide, history of open access. Um, I think this is actually interesting for the humanities, and it does come up time and time again in the controversies that emerge, which is that the history of open access is rooted in a computer science uh, approach. And then um, high energy physics is one of the disciplines that really pioneers the way for open access in general. So as I trace the history, Richard Stallman's drafting of the GNU Public License in 1989 forms a crucial component here. Radically rethinking the purpose of copyright and what authors are doing in contemporary society. So for Stallman, um, who is obviously a software engineer and pioneer of free software in the sense of freedom to reuse, um, there's a problem in society in that our lives are increasingly controlled by computer systems, but we don't know what those computer systems are doing because the code is proprietary. It goes through a compiler which obfuscates the function of that code, and we can't control the systems that do our credit scoring algorithms, our traffic cameras, our heart rate monitors, all the elements of contemporary society. So Stallman, for example, citing a 1930s court case in the, in the United States Supreme Court of America versus um, Fox, notes that the Supreme Court ruled the sole purpose of copyright is a benefit derived to the public when work enters the public domain. 
and that it's a temporary bargaining of freedom that is given when we give an exclusive time-limited monopoly to copyright holders to incentivize production. So Stallman says, I'm going to create a license that inverts that and says, you may do whatever you like with my code so long as you attribute um, me as the original author and as long as you give the same freedom to others. And that's a, a viral copyleft license for GPL. Leaping forward from there, and um, Harvard-based lawyer Larry Lessig, the founder of the Creative Commons uh, Foundation, decides that actually great poets steal, as well as computer programmers, and that we have a history of cultural production that seems to be premised on this idea of the lone genius, but actually it's completely false. We all know that there is very little originality in any cultural production, that everything is incremental. So La um, Lessig posits that the current system of copyright is not doing us any favors. And he comes up with a series of licenses that extend beyond computer software into the production of any manner of cultural artifact, be that uh, images, poetry, uh, and the writings of academics, most crucially for the topic at hand. So trying to expand this idea of open permissiveness in terms of copyright to the broader audience. 2002, we see three influential statements on open access release, the Triple B statements, Bethesda, Budapest, and Berlin declarations on open access, a proliferation of sub-institutional mandates from then on, and then from 2003, 2013, uh, and onwards now, an exponential increase in green mandates for open access. Uh, and my basic line when we talk about this is that the internet is not going away, um, and you can't just ignore what's going on. So it has this unstoppable force at this point. As Martin said, it has one openness, but there are still controversies to overcome. So when I'm talking to humanities audiences about this, what I point out is that there is a scientific drive here, which is usually um, the agenda of centre-right governments who want to see sites of value extraction of scientific research that are distant from the university. That's their industry tie-in. They want to see that. But the humanities are also present throughout this history. In fact, the principal drafter of the Budapest Open Access Declaration, Peter Suber, is a philosopher of epistemology and ethics. Uh, likewise, Jean-Claude Guedon, a professor of comparative literature at Montreal, was a signatory to all three initial declarations. So underrepresented and underengaged in these debates, but nonetheless present throughout their histories. We also know, though, that when humanities academics go to put their work online, do online projects, by default, they do open access. They might not call it that, but they go to the internet for its ability to reach mass audiences without paywalls getting in the way. So there are now a, a large number of journal and book publishers led by academics in the humanities that do open access peer review publication, and there are digital humanities projects that from day one were just open on the internet, open access. Okay, next slide. So that's what we've got as a background, why, um, what open access is, but why do we need it in the humanities as opposed to just the sciences? And I've got to give three uh, quick rationales here that come up throughout the book. Um, this is researcher access, public access, and reuse. So if you go on to researcher access, the first ne next slide, and this is one of my favorite slides. If we were going to set up a model for disseminating our work today, we would not build the economic situation that we have. It is a legacy of print that is entirely damaging to the dissemination of work. And it's caught in a further trap, which is that research material acts not just as a dissemination vessel. It is also a unit of accreditation. And that gives us two economies that are working side by side. In one economic sphere, there are researchers who want to publish in specific venues because that's how they think they're going to be appraised, and that will lead to their own material gain of being hired, being promoted, etc. In the other sphere, there's a library budget that has to pay for the subscriptions year on year that are driven by this other symbolic economy of prestige. So two economies, one material, one symbolic, and they map onto each other. And we can clearly see this when we consider that um, the price of subscribing to all the material we need in the university has risen by 300% above inflation since 1986. In the sciences, we know the usual suspects who are, are wheeled out as the bad guys, Elsevier with its 37% profit margin and a revenue stream of £2.06 billion in 2012. It's, you know, it's, it's easy to say what on earth has gone wrong here. In the humanities, we do have publishers, though, that are making a lot of money, even if in absolute terms it's lower. And I think particularly distressing is the fact that 
often now um, the publishers we're dealing with are vast international consortiums rather than the small on-the-ground entities that humanities researchers think they're dealing with. So Bloomsbury Academic, for example, bought Berg, TNT, Clark, Cassell, Meta and Drama, Arden, Shakespeare, Ca um, Continuum, the list goes on. And so there are these brand names that originally were mission-driven publishers that have now become part of international conglomerates that do make hundreds of millions of pounds per year, even in the humanities. And this leads to an access gap. We don't have enough money to buy back all the material we need for our students and for our researchers to do their jobs day to day. We also know that from 2008, the Research Information Network posited that the unpaid non-cash costs of peer review undertaken in the main by academics worldwide is 1.9 billion pounds. And that was 2008, so I'm sure that has gone up by now. So we're paying for this at multiple times in the cycle, and researchers fundamentally just don't care. They publish where they will get symbolic return, and the library can deal with the material fallout at the other end of that system. Next slide. The public are denied access. Um, there's a difference here in how this works between the humanities and the sciences. A lot of the events around open access I've been at uh, for the sciences will bring out the um, teenage genius scientist who had access to the literature on cancer research and made a breakthrough. And they're incredibly rare, those moments, but they are you know, a ray of hope um, that if you give access to the broadest spectrum of, of people, you may just get a return beyond anything you'd ever imagined. In the humanities, I don't think anyone's going to cure cancer from being able to read our work, but we do keep justifying our value in terms of critical thinking within society. Um, you know, the explication of cultures, histories, artistic practices in the main as part of what we'd like to see in any uh, civilized society. We don't want one that is just quantitative, we want some qualitative analysis in there. We want people who think. Fair enough. But I can't see how that justification can currently hold up. We have an increasingly educated populace who have been through higher education degrees. However, in many economies now, as I was pointing out in my question to Martin, um, this is paid for through a fee-based system underwritten by debt. So in that situation, if you can't continue to engage with the work that interested you while you were at university, it strikes me that the humanities become a system for deferring employment in times of uh, austerity and a factory for producing debt, which is nowhere near the mission statement that most in those disciplines would, would give to their own departments. So my fear is that the humanities become irrelevant if this work does not have broader public appeal. And I'm not necessarily arguing that we change our practice in a utilitarian way, but I am thinking through the, the repercussions of continuing to hide our work behind paywalls. I think what, what I was getting at in that question I, I put to Martin was, can research be a substitute for teaching when that is the primary income source, particularly for the humanities disciplines? Can work be accessible in the sense of being understandable, jargon-free, and, and populist in some senses if we rely on uh, teaching people how to understand complex work as part of a degree for which they pay and which our continued economic stream relies on. Just one of the interesting contradictions at the heart of this setup. Next slide. So finally, for my three um, reasons why we might want open access, restrictive reuse rights under fair dealing in copyright is currently damaging our practice in the academy. First thing to point out is that, yes, I give my journal articles to publishers and they don't give me anything back for it, but actually I wouldn't want anything back for it because I am paid a salary anyway. But if I want to photocopy the work of one of my colleagues for teaching and dissemination in class, we have to pay a license every year to the Copyright Clearance Centre. So we have this problem of another point where we're being asked to work, pay for work that was given by academics within a system for the purposes of dissemination that is then signed over to entities who are beholden to a market. We also know that in certain jurisdictions where there aren't exemptions, text mining, which involves the creation of a derivatives, derivative, is prohibited. That means that various emergent digital humanities practices might find themselves in trouble here. We also know that from Crossref data that the number one click-through source to academic articles is to be cited in Wikipedia. So if you want to be read, get cited in Wikipedia. But I'd also like to think we could go further than this. There's a companion site to Wikipedia, Wikisource. What if we could get our books and our journal articles live on that venue? We'd have something very powerful for those who work on Wikipedia to cite and resource and to show our value in a public way. 
And last but not least, um, the humanities often talk in rhetoric sort of inclusiveness and um, you know, the human in, in an, age of an age of globalization. Post-colonialism, for example, is the dominant discourse in many humanities fields for the past 40 years. But we still have English as the primary mechanism and privileged discourse of scholarly communication. If we let others make derivatives, community translation might be a potential way to address some of that and, and eliminate some of the hypocrisy from the rhetoric that's circulating here. OK, so next slide. So open access looks likely to be the solution to many of these problems. Um, it's not the solution to everything, and there are broader structural problems with the economics of the academy that need to be fixed if we want to go totally open, I'd contend. But we reached a tipping point around 2013 with green looking likely to succeed. Now, green open access, though, doesn't fix the economic mess. We're still dependent on hyperinflationary price increases to do so. Um, I mean, I also agree with Martin in his book that if gold is just a substitute for those hyperinflationary price increases via the same old publishers, then you don't fix the problem in any way anyway. But that's um, something we can talk about later. Gold is a better fix if it's done well and not done through um, those big major players who are simply seeking to double dip in a hybrid environment. However, and if you go to the next slide, which is just a little interim wording, article processing charges as a model are unaffordable for many disciplines. And this is because they act to concentrate risk or cost. So there is no problem with paying for publishing from the supply side. It doesn't have to have those implications for quality that many have um, discussed. But if you're going to say the current model of subscriptions is one where a large number of institutions all pay a relatively modest amount, so that essentially there is enough money for an organization to do the labor, build a surplus, and or profit, then that's one way you can spread the cost between universities and the person submitting doesn't pay. If you're going to say, this institution or this researcher is to solely bear the cost of their own publications, then that does change the configuration of the economics between the disciplines and between institutions. Some research intensive institutions will end up paying a lot more under that scheme than they ever did for a subscription, which may mean that they need, if there's any federal funding involved, to reallocate resources into a fixed scheme that privileges those institutions and thereby hampers mobility for other institutions who want to break into the research intensive sphere, etc. It also is the case that in the humanities, most research is unfunded in the sense of externally funded. Uh, researchers are usually given a day, of their, a day of time by the institutions, a stack of books or an access to an archive. They go off, find out something, and write about it. Where's the money from APC coming from? Well, it's triggered a lot of worry, as you might expect. Okay, so the next slide, though. I mean, so monographs are a really thorny issue here. I know there's a kind of irony in that Martin and I have just both published open access monographs. Martin worked through an APC model. I worked through Cambridge, who simply decided to underwrite it, the, the cost themselves as part of an experiment to see what open access does to their print sales. But almost universally, apart from the Wellcome Trust and a couple of other funders, monographs are acknowledged as different and objectively harder in the open access sphere. So the hefty mandate in the UK, for example, for a post-2014 ref excludes monographs. I agree with some of these nationales. I disagree with others. But it is true there are higher barriers to entry for new publishers. Very few humanities researchers have a second book sitting in their drawer that they could give to a new open access publisher as an act of um, altruism. That's what I believe I should do. If they think they're going to play the prestige game, then they'll want to give it to an established press and, and go that route. So it's harder to solicit material of a high quality as you break into this, even harder than for a new journal. We also know that open source platform development for um, open access books is in its infancy. Open Monograph Press, the companion to open journal systems, is a very young piece of kit. And the production tool chain, likewise, is very expensive and usually proprietary at, pre pre at present. So we need to work on how we can build tools to facilitate that. I'll just lastly say on books that there are different discoverability and value conferral sites for certain types of um, academic book. So if you're a popular historian, you want to be featured in the local bookshop, which means you may have to work with a trade publisher who's less aware of the open access system and simply used to um, working in print and selling, which can present basically you're starting again, whereas if you're with an academic publisher, at least they should be aware of these debates, even if they're not there yet. So a whole system of complex economics and aggregation channels surround the monograph. 
So last but not least, um, there are a variety of controversies um, in the humanities I could have talked about, like the resistance to open licensing due to plagiarism, the fear over APCs that I have touched upon, um, many other spheres of worry. Um, but I'm just going to sum up with some points about the drivers of the problems in humanities disciplines. And I will say that although it's often said the humanities won't just follow the sciences, I think for the most part they seem to be. Um, the, the, te the teleology looks the same to me. Ten years ago, all these same arguments were circulating among the scientists. Some of them still persist there. It's unsurprising to see them come up again. But I would posit that prestige and a conservative climate is the number one driver of financial problems because it empowers existing entities who wish to cling to their current market dominance through a subscription model. Secondly, that means these legacy organizations have pre-open access, sometimes pre-digital models that present a problem. How can they change their scope, become a lean entity um, in that precise scenario? They can't just lay off their whole marketing department overnight. If they've got premises, they have to pay for it. So they should be out-competed easily, but often they're not because they hold such strong prestige. And last but not least, I think the profit motive is in direct contradiction to the function of dissemination of work. If we want to get as broadly circulated as possible and as much material as possible, we need to work on a sustainability front. I know that word is overused, but there are costs involved in publishing and we should acknowledge those. We should work to figure out what they are on a not-for-profit basis so that society more broadly benefits. Last slide then, are just some suggestions for any solution that might um, address this to rapidly gain prestige, a lean operating model, addressing this dysfunctional profit, and if you finally click through, uh, that's just a quick plug for the project I'm building at the moment, the Open Library of Humanities, um, which you can check out at openlibhums.org if you so wish. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll come back into the chat now, and hopefully we can have a bit of a discussion. Okay, uh, thanks. Okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> I'll I'll break the ice, Martin. It says Natalie, by the way, if, if you knew to, if that's Martin speaking. Um, I think uh, I, I, I like your talk very much, and I've enjoyed reading your book. I haven't finished it yet. It was longer than mine. So. Um, I think one of the interesting things is um, we're still kind of stuck in kind of old ways of thinking, aren't we? I and mean, I think there's there are different models to explore. So I think um, for instance, universities used to do um, university presses, and we used to publish our our own books. We kind of stopped doing that really because we started that wasn't the business we, we wanted to be in. It strikes me in a digital age with you know, print on demand, and this is exactly the sort of business that we could be in as universities, and, and why not do it? So we could be publishing. If, if every university had a budget to publish its own books, kind of, you know, rather than buying books from elsewhere, and simply running open access journals uh, out of its own budget rather than buying subscriptions, you could easily recreate the kind of current ecosystem for free uh, uh, for users and less cost for universities. So I wondered if you had any ideas on. Um, and other types of models you think that might might come up and might be interesting to explore? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I think the interesting thing about university presses is that they have brand affiliation with universities. So that strikes me as potentially problematic because it becomes another ground for administration to fight over for brand preservation and so forth. I mean, I mean the model you're suggesting of academics publishing in their own university presses is pretty sensible, but it, it raises, you get eyebrows raised because of that conservative climate that you also mentioned and the web being stuck in the ways of thinking that external entities have to validate this, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, with caution, a proliferation of university presses, whether publishing their own work or others in an open access mode, is going to work out far cheaper in the long run, especially now we have this digital first workflow and open access as, as an option. And I think you could even co-opt the, the brand managerialism as a good aspect here. If managers want to be proud of the content in the repository, then there should be, able to, should be a case to invest in it, and we could go down that route. 
And from my perspective, the most interesting models are those that create new risk pools. And I, I'm not um, impartial in this because I'm setting up a project that tries to do it. But we're essentially trying to get several hundred libraries together to all pay at first about $1,000 each into a central fund, not for their own researchers to publish because that gives you the concentration of risk, but rather so that whoever comes to us and passes quality control, we can pay for the labor out of that central pot. And in that way, you build a cooperative ecosystem of libraries funding work that can actually transition. So the point there would be, if we can lure societies onto our system, then that would be a direct cancellation for libraries when it comes on board our system as opposed to a subscription publisher, and the project can grow from there. And there are several other projects that have that, a similar model, like Archive, Knowledge Unlatched, and to an extent, Scope 3. So there, there's precedent for it working as well. Um, so I think, in my mind, gold on an APC model is the least radical of the solutions we have. Um, it does potentially address some of the problems if you if a market really does develop where people drive the prices down and make it harder for those monopolistic entities to continue. But I agree with you entirely. There's a lot of conservative think going on. There's a resistance to, to openness as a principle, and in my case, open access in the specific. That means that anything you build at the moment has to fit those conservative paradigms so that you fix one problem at a time. Let's address open access as, in my, in my world, I'm going to address open access and I'm going to build something that looks quite conservative in some respect. Then we can work on changing people's attitudes towards prestige that cause these problems of lock-in towards the idea that publisher brand should be the thing they assess on, et cetera, and do it incrementally. I mean, we could discuss Cameron's point, actually, Martin, because when I read your book, I, I thought the same. I mean, you, I thought you were quite careful to define what you were talking about there. You said, um, gold open access, as it's traditionally conceived, meaning the APC model of traditional publishers who are basically trying to co-opt openness, um, is more conservative in some ways than green. Um, and I kind of agree in that particular case, but more broadly, it strikes me, gold is a more radical reconfiguration and changes notions of what publishing is for, publishing as a service rather than a commodity item purchase. I just wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, I think it's interesting that gold, I've kind of been against it, for it, and somewhere in the middle now, I think. Um, I think my point in the book was that I think for publishers, Particularly the way the Finch report came out, it was kind of it was okay. We just business as usual, really. We're just getting the money from a, a different route, and maybe we're even making more money to this route. So I think it kind of it took away some of that incentive to um, innovate that I think is is possible and desired uh, now. But I think uh, I, I think you're right. You know, gold can be a really interesting route, and sometimes it's, it is a matter of scale. I think we said at the start. So um, I'm not on the board of Ubiquity, I think, but to give them another plug. So I publish a, a journal with them, so John is publishing them, and they charge £300 per uh, article, so for the, the fees. Um, and actually, we pay that at the university, so we're prepared to sort of fund that. But that strikes me as a perfectly reasonable fee to pay, as opposed to £5,000. So there is a kind of a, an element of, um, of what's, a, what's a fair amount to pay for this kind of stuff. It's not just, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a buy anything like, you know, you shouldn't pay anything or it's whatever you want. So I think, the amount matters, but I think you're right, that, that does lend itself then to being a sustainable model, and you can have all the things you want. Um, I noticed your comment, you said you thought they were predatory non-OA journals as well, but I think that fee, that gold route, does open itself up to predatory practice much more, because you're getting a direct payment from the author, so people can be suckered in from these kind of, sort of fake journals that set up and say, you know, pay pay £2,000 to publish, and I was speaking to someone the other day, so that they got invited to do a special edition of an issue being edited, and oh, that's great, and then a couple of weeks later, I got an email saying, now you have to pay £1,500 to um, publish your editorial, and they were just kind of really to try and set up a, a pyramid selling scheme, which you didn't have before when the payment was coming through live subscriptions, because it was much more difficult to do that. Um, so I think it does kind of slightly change the, the, the nature of that relationship, but, uh, but I think also it makes it a, a more interesting ecosystem.
Yeah, I mean, my, I, I, I just know from experience that after almost any conference I go to, there's uh, dubious publishers send around emails to all the participants sell, to put together an edited book collection in my discipline. But they then sell on to libraries because they, they got people who basically done the peer review themselves in that room where they gave the conference presentation and then they do none of that themselves. So that is a subscription predatory model and people are very aware of it. But I think you're right, the, the author facing charge basically makes it completely transparent. I do stand by my point though actually that it's only possible because we don't know which academics did the peer review. If that were transparent, that predatory practice would be completely impossible because you wouldn't be evaluating the publisher's offering, you'd be evaluating which academics said this was good, whereas you don't know if there's any peer review in the predatory model at that point of its slackness. Uh, okay, we now uh, okay. Okay. So we call it a day. <laughs> I think that's it. It's just me and you talking to each other. Well, thank you very much, Martin, for organising this, and thank you.